Hey guys, welcome back to Ranger Survival and Fieldcraft. I'm Andrew, and what I have for you today is lightweight survival kit. Stand by. Hey, real quick, like and subscribe. Leave a comment. Thanks. So today what we have is a lightweight survival kit and this kit weighs in at 12.2 pounds but it does include water. Our water capacity is 100 ounces which is over 6 pounds. Subtract that water weight from our original weight and we have a dry bag survival kit that is roughly 6 pounds which is why I consider it a lightweight survival kit. Now this kit is modeled after military survival training and then hiking experiences I've had up here in the Rocky Mountains. This kit comes in the form of a camelback. Now this camelback, I had a similar camelback I had to carry during military training. It had an active GPS inside so I could be tracked by cadre. It had a resupply of radio batteries and iodine tablets while we were out there so we could refit on water and keep our radios alive. And then it even had an emergency kit for a real life survival scenario so we could treat a casualty, remain warm, and avoid exposure out in the elements. Now this kit also contains items from a recent hiking experience. Went up to about 12,000 feet with a group of friends, found a good location to bed down for the night. Freezing rain, dropping temperatures, high winds, came in and we sheltered in a cave, made a pine bough bed, built a fire and stayed warm in there overnight. We even had one of the members of our group go down with altitude sickness and had to monitor him for the night until we could actually walk down the mountain the next morning. But this kit is lightweight, designed for a high water capacity so that we have plenty of water to stay hydrated while we move over distance and can still keep us safe and survive a cold night on a mountain. All right, so there are a lot of items laid out here. This is a very robust kit. Even though temperatures are going up at lower elevations, at higher elevations, every thousand foot gain in elevation is roughly about five degree drop in temperature. So it still gets cold up at night on the mountains. Even though it may be warm during the day, we can travel light, but we still wanna have the ability to start fire, stay warm, things to stay hydrated, maintain thermal regulation, protect ourselves from the cold environment, and then ways to shelter and maximize the landscape around us while still having a very light kit to take into the wilderness. So let's go ahead and dive into this kit. We're gonna go by survival priority and look over the components of the kit, talk about them a little bit, and then pack it all back up in our camelback and continue our hike. Let's go. Now water in a hot environment and then at elevation is incredibly important. We need to have a good water survival kit. We have a way to carry water, 100 ounces in our camelback, that's our primary. And then we have other ways to treat or purify water on the move. First way is with tablets. We have tablets we can use, one liter per tablet. Put three of these in our bladder with dirty water and we can disinfect that water with these tablets. We even have filters and then extra bladders that we can attach this filter to, fill the bladder up, attach the filter, and then drink straight from this bladder through the filter, purifying that water. And what I like about this filter, this is a Sawyer Mini Squeeze. We have the gray end and we have the blue end. We can make this an inline filter with our Camelback cut the hose of the camelback, attach the gray end toward the bladder, the blue end toward the mouthpiece of the hose, and then fill the bladder up with dirty water. And we can drink that water through this filter. It filters the water for us as fast as we can drink it. And having an inline filter like that makes this a very versatile kit. But wait, there's more. No kit is complete without a canteen cup or some sort of metal container to boil water. Huge fan of Old Faithful here, the canteen cup, and it fits inside this kit. We can put smaller items in this canteen cup and put it in the outside pocket, and we still have a way to boil water. So our water kit is very robust, and this still fits all inside our Camelback backpack here for our lightweight survival kit. Good to go. I recommend everyone go into the Wilderness Tool Heavy, and what I mean by that is we have to have tools that will take down large sections of material, 
another tool that can process those sections if necessary or make feather sticks or carving, batoning, something of that effect. And then a smaller multi-tool that has the ability to do what these tools can do to some degree, not as well, obviously, but if we lose all these, we still have some sort of multi-tool or pocket knife that can function to some degree as these would. For large materials, a saw, way more efficient, lightweight, easy to use, and less dangerous to us as compared to a hatchet in a survival situation. And then to process that material down, we have a fixed blade knife, more companion HD, heavy duty. It's a great knife to have rubberized handle for good dexterity and grip. Add some 550 cord to the sheath and it's a mini survival kit. And then for our pocket knife or multi-tool, just a Leatherman wave here, pliers, extra set of hands. We can use it to manipulate man-made objects we find in the wild. And then we can access the tools on the exterior of the knife one-handed if need be, in the event one hand is injured for whatever reason, or we have poor dexterity, we can still access those tools. So these tools are gonna be part of our survival kit. Now for our medical kit, we have tourniquet, and Israeli bandage for hemorrhaging and stopping bleeding immediately to save a life and prevent death. And then we have more routine items. I included a sewing kit because we can do suturing with a sewing kit, although not advised. And then we have things like duct tape for improvisation, making band-aids, we have a cravat and then a schmog. Cravat and schmog are both 100% cotton pieces of material. We can use these as dressings, improvised tourniquets. We can use them for splints, slings, swathing limbs together. And we can also use these for char cloth making strainers, for water collection, and they serve a variety of functions. But you can see this medical kit, not only do we have direct medical aid devices, but we have items that function as our medical kit that are multifunctional and reach across several spectrums of survival priority for this kit, making it a very versatile and functioning kit. For our signaling kit, you may notice that some items jump out from other priorities of survival, and that's the intent of a multifunctional and versatile kit. This one being the compass, we can use the sighting mirror as a signaling mirror, and then even the whistle on our pace beads as an auditory signal. Orange bandana, we can wear it, make ourselves a signal, use it as a flag or a marker. We have a flare, good ground air signal. We can shoot it in front of aircrafts and identify ourselves on the ground for search and rescue aircraft. We have a chem light with 550 cord around it. Use this as a passive signal, hang it above our camp at night, undo the string, swing it in a large circle during hours of limited visibility so rescuers can see it. That's a good signal to have at nighttime. IR strobe, big fan of IR strobes, especially military ones. We have the IR cover for night vision devices for rescuers, and then we can remove that. And we have the actual white light blinking. We can even take this, extend out the body, and make it directional. There's a blue cover on the inside that we could use and point this in the direction rescuers are coming to alert them to our presence. So an IR strobe, especially one that's multifunctional like this, making it directional and even works at nighttime in a non-permissive environment is great to have. Spare batteries for that. A VS-17 panel. Old habits die hard. I like VS-17 panels, especially ones like this. Rectangular in shape, green on one side, orange on the other. We can fold this up and then even use it as an active signal, flashing it in the wood line. Good to go. Lightweight, go in my kit. Then we have our headlamp. This can be used as a signaling device as well as land navigation at nighttime. We can use the strobe as a passive signal to signal recovery forces or search and rescue. And then lastly, a 55 gallon drum liner that is orange. Use this as a poncho for shelter. We can also use this as a flag or a marker to mark our location, even as a ground to air signal. It's good to have something like this that we can manipulate, even wear on our bodies to protect ourselves and then make ourselves a signal as well. But this is our signaling kit. All right, land navigation kit. Everybody that goes to the field should know how to land navigate to some extent, at least how to plot, find a point, walk to that point, and have a good pace count. So we have a compass, gives us a good azimuth or direction that we can find. You can attach pacing beads so we can count our paces as we walk and get an accurate distance that we've traveled. Waterproof map, highly recommend a waterproof map or a way to waterproof a map inside a plastic bag. We can even take this map, make a printout of the section we need before we leave home and then keep that in a plastic bag inside our kit as an emergency map just in the event that we lose this map, we still have that backup map. GPS, recommend everybody has a GPS. 
recommend that you only use it for actually checking your location as opposed to land navigating with it. It takes all the fun out of it, but having a GPS to check your position in the event you're lost, you can plot the point that you're at, draw a distance and direction to the point that you need to go to, and then walk to that location easily enough. And then finally, a headlamp to see during hours of limited visibility at nighttime, and then spare batteries for the headlamp and then for the GPS. But this is a good land navigation kit to go to the field with. This last weekend ended up using a lot of tinder tabs to get a fire going just because I wanted to try them out. Turns out they were crap. So we're going to use a robust fire kit and go back to the basics. Fire lens using the sun's rays to start a fire. Our handy dandy ranger lighter. Use the lighter as a first go to. The tape as a flame extender. Hidden secret tinder underneath the cap and then the chapstick obviously to keep our warrior lips supple. Ferro rod, good go to. 100 mile an hour tape sheath to protect that ferro rod from erosion. Then we have stormproof matches for a good fire starting kit. And then wet fire or tinder that will light even in inclement weather, like the inclement weather that's rolling in right now. have a good tinder source like this wet fire. I've used it a lot now and I trust it. So a good robust fire kit that we can use to start a fire, especially when we're confused, dizzy, exhausted, and we have poor dexterity. So we have a ton of different items to start that fire and take advantage of all the sources of fire in our repertoire here. So a good fire kit is definitely necessary. All right, just like clockwork, the thunderstorm is rolling in. So we're gonna go over shelter now. Now for our shelter kit, we have a Mylar space blanket. This is heavy duty, reinforced grommets. We can use this to string up in between two trees and make a shelter to get out of the elements. And then we can even use the Mylar on the inside as a fire reflector and as a signal, put three big X's or a large X on that Mylar side and use it as a signal for rescuers. We have two 55 gallon drum liners to use as a poncho and wear during a thunderstorm. We can even fill these with debris and make browse beds. Place it right underneath our shelter and insulate ourselves from the ground. No kit is complete without 550 cord. Green 550 is our ridge line. The multi-cam is for utility. And then finally, we have gloves as a form of shelter to protect our hands and then keep us safe and add an extra layer of protection against the elements so we can defend against those elements and protect ourselves just a little bit more. Gloves in the wilderness are important to have to safeguard our hands because we're we'll be using our hands a lot. But this is our shelter kit. All right, we talked about shelter, fire, water, signaling, land navigation, and medical aid. Let's talk about some food. Food, we need to have a good rations pack. High calorie energy bars to get that fat and those carbohydrates back in our system. Beef jerky for protein, to put that protein and that sodium back in our system. And even electrolyte drink powder mixes like this drip drop. Drop top! We can use this, put it back in our system to stay hydrated. It's a lot of work moving around the mountains, going up and down terrain. We're going to sweat a lot and lose a lot of electrolytes. So we need to replenish those fluids and get it back in our system. But having a good food kit like this or a rations pack can get us through a 24-hour survival scenario or longer without having to rely too much on wild plants or other sources. So have a good food kit. All right, gang, that uh, thunder rolling in is my cutest skidoo. I'm going to try to make it off the mountain here and get back to the truck before I get too much of the storms that are rolling in right now. But I hope you like this video. Again, a lightweight survival kit with a lot of versatility in it based off an actual emergency kit I carried in training and then a lot of things I've learned out here in the mountains. But if you did like this video, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave me a comment in the comment section. I always appreciate your feedback. I want to thank you guys for everything you do for me and for the channel, for your likes, your views, your subscriptions, your comments, your feedback, and your shares. And I'll be back with another video as soon as I can, guys. Thanks. Mm -hmm.